for the demonstration. Oh, yeah. Okay, so maybe let's get started. We're super happy to have uh, another one of our colleagues from the EE department today, uh, Professor David Che, uh, who is going to tell you about some of the uh, how some of our information principles that we discussed in the in this course manifest in blockchain. So please. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so I'm David, David Shane. And uh, so I heard that you guys are the smartest students in the entire incoming class of Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my colleague told me. In fact, I was not really very eager in coming to give this presentation. <laughs> because like other faculty, I have lots of other things to do. <laughs> but they told me that we are, I have the pleasure of teaching to the most, the best students of the lot. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. Don't disappoint me. So to test, it, <laughs> to test that, to test that, let me let us first answer this question, okay? All right. I give you a coin. You flip it 10,000 times. How many are heads? Sorry? Approximately 5,000. Approximately 5,000. Okay. So if I flip it two times, can you say approximately one time? So in other words, if you flip it two times, you don't know, right? You basically can be one, can be two. But if you flip it many times, then approximately half the time is hex. Okay? Is that okay? All right. Do people know that there's a name for this uh, statement, the justified statement? Fallacy. Sorry? Something fallacy. Central limit theorem. Ah, close to, almost like central limit theorem, but actually it's simpler than that. Okay. Any Law of large numbers, very good. Okay. <laughs> Say you guys are wrong. These students know a lot. <laughs> My graduate students, they struggle a little bit about answering this question, so good. All right. So law of large numbers says that if you do something many, many times, then the fraction of times in which you succeed is the, roughly the probability of which you succeed each time. Okay? And if your coin is a bias, say one third head, then you expect about 3,333 3, times, roughly. Okay? All right. So today, I'm not going to lecture on probability, just in case you get confused. <laughs> but I'm lecturing on a topic which I've been working on quite a bit lately called blockchain. Okay, so you may ask, what the heck is the connection between blockchains and this question? Okay, so you have to wait. It will show up. All right. In fact, this is this answer to this question is actually the central, the central idea in blockchain. And uh, you see this nice uh, visualization here. Okay, this is a blockchain protocol running right now. Okay, and uh, my goal is to explain to you what the heck is going on here, and what is blockchain and so forth. Okay, how many people have heard of blockchain? Okay. How people have actually done some coding, built a blockchain? Okay, no expert here, good, I can now be asking more. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> you never know, you never know. Last time I was teaching uh, a genomic sequencing course, okay? And it turned out that one of my students was a freshman, and he has actually done many sequence experiments already before he came to Stanford. So, <laughs> all right, so let's start. Okay, so uh, the title of this presentation is called Scaling Bitcoin to Physical Limits, okay? So I will try to explain what these things are. Okay, so, you know, in science, in engineering, breakthroughs don't happen every day. Although people claim that there are breakthroughs every day, 
That's not true, okay? <laughs> Only every now and then there's a breakthrough. And in 2008, in 2008, a, a true breakthrough has happened. And uh, this breakthrough is in the terms of a particular system called Bitcoin, okay? And this paper written by this guy, Satoshi Nakamoto. Do you know him, Satoshi Nakamoto? Very legendary guy. Nobody knew who he is, okay? So this paper showed up in the internet. Nobody knew who wrote it. He had a system designed already. This paper describes that system. And uh, this is a really cool system, okay? Because if you think about it, what it's trying to do is an electronic cash system, okay? But what is the underlying basis of a cash system? Like, what is the underlying basis of, say, US dollar? Or, you know, Roman B, or Canadian dollars, okay? The underlying basis is that the currency is issued by some central authority, okay, like the monetary authority. So that is a very uh, respectable authority, and you believe that authority, and so there's a lot of trust on that central authority, and that's the back end of the currency, okay? This is a totally different design. There is no central authority that issues this, co this coin. It is completely actually decentralized. There's no single authority. And yet, through uh, computational and cryptographic methods, it is able to maintain trust in the system. Okay? So the goal of this talk is to sort of explain a little bit about the system. And but I want to get to the research, which is how I can improve the system. So let's first uh, describe this a little bit. So if you look at Bitcoin, okay, then its performance sort of has three metrics, okay? Now, one is core security. Okay, so what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is basically maintaining a list of transactions that people have spent from the beginning of time to keep track of how many people, how, how much money, how much Bitcoin has each of the individual have. Okay? So think about it, it's maintaining a ledger. Okay? But this ledger, <coughs> everybody has to agree on the same ledger. Otherwise, you think that, hey, person X has, you think that I have a certain amount of money, the other person thinks the other, you have a different amount of money. That doesn't work then nobody will use the system, right? So the key word here is trust. And the security of the system is such that if someone tries to screw you up, try to attack the system, can they sort of change the ledger and thereby destroy trust in the system? And Bitcoin has a very strong notion of security. Basically, it is saying that even if the adversary has 49.99% of the power of the whole network, the system can still be secure. When it's above 50% then it's adversely stronger than all the honest people together, then there's no hope. So in some sense, Bitcoin is like the optimal security system. Very beautiful, amazing system. And we'll go into a little bit detail of what that means, okay? So right now, we're only saying English, but we'll go into a little bit of the math later on, okay? However, in the other performance metric, the performance is very, very poor. So Bitcoin is processing about seven transactions per second, okay? All right, everybody has a credit card here, right? Use Visa. Visa processes about 10,000 transactions per second worldwide, okay? So Bitcoin is also a worldwide currency, only seven transactions per second, so very slow. There's a concept called confirmation latency, which is that when you have a transaction, how long does Bitcoin have to wait until it tells you, okay, your transaction is now in the ledger permanently and will not be changed? Turns out you have to wait hours for this confirmation to happen, so very long. So that means if you spend something, 
then I can't really immediately give you a, a coffee. If you want to buy coffee, I can't immediately give you coffee because I don't know whether your transaction is actually legitimate. I have to wait a long time. So that's sort of the set the stage. And uh, when I started thinking about the problem, I was trying to, we were trying to find a protocol that improved on Bitcoin by keeping the security at 50% but the transaction throughput and latency much better, okay? All right, now, this course is called Information. Science of Information. Science of Information, okay. Now, I don't know what these guys have taught you, you know, but one of the basic concepts of science information is about this notion of limits, okay? Do you teach this concept? Yes. Limits, okay, good. This is not limits to our own thinking, okay? We have a lot of limits like that. But this is to say that if you give me a problem, an engineering problem, and you try to design a good scheme to perform well, is there any sort of physical limits imposed by the physics of the system? Such that you, there's no hope of building a system with better performance. And so your goal should be to get close to those limits. So when we first think about this problem, we start saying, Okay, so if I can scale performance, what is the best that we can do? Okay, so that kind of sets a benchmark, and that allows us to design a system that gets close to the benchmark. Okay, so physical limits. Okay, so Bitcoin is a so called a worldwide network. So you have many nodes, okay, and the way they achieve so called consensus on the ledger is they have to communicate information between each other, right? Because if you want to get agreement among many people, <coughs> well, you have to talk to each other. If you don't talk to each other, then how do you know we have agreement? So talking, communicating is crucial, okay? And so there's an underlying network. There's an underlying network through which this communication happens. And that network is kind of the physical substrate on which Bitcoin, the software, is built on. And so the property of this physical network put a certain constraint on how fast Bitcoin can operate. Okay? To give an example, one important parameter is the so-called network bandwidth, or the capacity, I guess the more technical term is capacity, is how many bits you can push through in a link communicating these nodes. An example, here's an example, is you have a 200 megabits per second link, okay? Now, if I want to get consensus, then this tells me how fast I can push things through, okay? Another important parameter is how long does it take to get one bit of information from point A to point B, right? Because if I'm worried about latency, <coughs> then the latency cannot exceed some of the speed of light, propagation delay of information. So therefore, the network bandwidth C kind of put an upper bound on how fast I can process transactions because the transactions have to go through the pipe as I communicate and exchange information. And the propagation delay gives a low bound on how fast I can confirm transactions. Because I at least tell each other this information. Okay, so this is a picture. If I plot the performance in terms of the transaction throughput and the confirmation latency, then the capacity or the bandwidth puts an upper bound to how fast you can process this. The speed of light delay puts a low bound on how low the latency can be. And Bitcoin is way over here. It is confirming in hours, whereas the delay is about seconds. So it's totally different orders of magnitude here. And the network capacity is like 200 megabits, which can process maybe, I don't know, 100,000 or 50,000 transactions per second, whereas Bitcoin is processing seven transactions per second. Okay? So this is one example where the limits tell you that hey, your system, Bitcoin here, 
There's something very weird about it, right? The gap between the performance of this system and the limits is very far. Okay? So a natural question is, is this very far something like, is, it, is there something reason for that? Maybe there's some other constraints that we have not discovered that poses constraint. Oh, is it just Bitcoin can be vastly improved? Okay, so these are the two options. So that's what we're gonna explore right now, okay? Any question at this point? Yeah? I just like go into how like this kind of cost determination is actually Yeah, I'll, I'll go through that. So to understand how to get from point A to point B. So, of course I'm spending here talking to you, right? That means actually I have, we have a solution to the problem. That means we're not stuck here. But we're here, okay? So today what I'm gonna to tell you is a new protocol that can get closer to here. But to understand how we can get from here to here, we first need to understand how Bitcoin works, okay? So Bitcoin is a protocol. It is a protocol through which distributed nodes can agree on something. It's called, the problem is called consensus or distributed decentralized consensus, okay? So I'll first spend 15 minutes explaining how Bitcoin works, the protocol works, and then we'll figure out how to improve it, okay? All right. Oh, I forgot to introduce my students, Vivek, okay? So Vivek is a collaborator on this project, and he will do a live demo at the end. So we actually built the software, okay, he'll do the live demo at the end. All right, good, all right. So how does Nakamoto's blockchain work, all right? So it is called blockchain. So if you look at the public press, they will call this technology blockchain. Blockchain is the name of the technology behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a currency, it's an application. Blockchain is a technology that maintains this decentralized trust or decentralized consensus. And this technology can have many different applications. Bitcoin is one of them, okay? All right, how does it work? The way it works is the following. Each block contains a bunch of transactions, okay? So in this system, people are making transactions continuously, right? Alice is paying Bob one Bitcoin. Bob is paying Charlie another two Bitcoins, etc. So these transactions are happening over time, okay? And then there are these guys, they're called miners, okay? Their job is to take these transactions, whatever they see, and put it in a block. And then try to put this block onto the blockchain in order to record these transactions, okay? So there, there is a beginning. The beginning block is called a genesis block. This block was created by Nakamoto in 2009. In the January of 2009, he started the network with the Genesis block, okay? And of course, he gives himself quite a lot of, yes, he mines, he mines a lot in the beginning, so he's got a bunch of Bitcoins, so he's very good. So this guy's very interesting, guys. He has about, last time I checked, six billion. Six billion USD worth of Bitcoin, okay? Never spent a single one of them. Because all this is in public, so you can check. No one has, has not spent a single one of them. No one knows where he is, who he is. Because if he sells them, people will recover. Yeah, that's easy to trace, yeah. Then, then he can trace them. Yeah. So he, is not, he doesn't want to release people who are stuff, but he's not spending any money either. Hey guys, think about it. There are only two things that motivate a person. I thought. One, was money. You at Stanford, right? So, okay, <laughs> so that's the one. Two is fame. Money and fame. But this guy doesn't care about fame because he had this great invention, but he's not even telling people who he is. So no one knows who he is. They cannot get fame. Two is, it's an interesting thing, he cares about money either. Six billion of big is lying there for 10 years. Um, question. Yeah. I, so when I heard about like Bitcoin and all of that, yeah. then they talk about a lot of times like the anonymity with it, and that's one of the reasons people like it. But how is this like? How does this work if the yeah. law is public? 
Yeah, actually, Bitcoin, this, I think there's a misconception. Yeah. Bitcoin by itself actually does not have an immutability. Now, there are people who build a layer on top of that privacy layer to try to immutability. Then you can imagine what applications those systems have. So we're not going to focus on that. So today, we're not going to focus on anonymity. Okay? All right. Okay. So, all right. So how does mining work? Okay. So here's what happens. Okay. A node will be solving a very difficult so-called cryptographic puzzle. So this is... This talk is not about the cryptography. So we're just gonna think of it as, you have to solve a very hard puzzle, and nobody knows how to solve it smartly, except for using brute force. That is, you just keep on trying some random tries. Okay? Keep on trying, trying, trying. And the puzzle is very hard. So to try giga times, trillion times, until you solve this puzzle, okay? So these miners are typically sitting maybe in Iceland, close to some geothermic, geothermal place where they can get cheap energy. So they run huge farms of servers, all of them built, dedicated to solve this puzzle. Okay, all right, so they're solving, cranking away, <coughs> and okay, finally, they solve the puzzle. And once they solve the puzzle, then the <coughs> block, they can distribute it to the rest of the world. I said, hey, I solved the puzzle, and here is the content associated with solving this puzzle. And then everybody will check, okay, this guy claimed he solved the puzzle, did he really solve the puzzle? Then they can check. Turns out it's hard to solve, but easy to check. Very important. Everybody can check, and if it's in the it's solved, then they just put it on the blockchain and say, okay, good. This guy solved the puzzle, and the puzzle has associated with it a pointer that points to the previous block, okay? All right, and this process continues, and different people may solve different blocks, and then they add to the blockchain. Okay, yeah. So this puzzle just like some layer of encrypting the transaction. Sorry. So like, if someone to make a block, does like every single like <coughs> computer system get a copy of it? Or? Yes. Yes. That's right. Good. So this blockchain is kept track, same blockchain, is kept track by all the computers in this network. Correct. Yeah. Is there a finite number of blocks? Uh, no, it just keeps on going. Mm -hmm. How many blocks do we have right now? 100,000 at this point? About 100,000 blocks, right? Half a, Half a million? Half a million blocks already? <laughs> okay. Half a million blocks. <coughs> and who comes up with the puzzles? Oh, the puzzles are automatically generated. The puzzle works like this. Hey, let's, let's check out the puzzle. Okay. The puzzle works like this. There's a function called a hash function, which is a very hard, which is a function that is easy to compute. Okay, what you do is you look at the previous block, okay? And then the, you put the transactions bits in there. And then you try to find an X such that it's less than a certain threshold. So this is called hash inequality. Now this hash function is easy to compute forward, but hard to invert backwards. So therefore, only, the only way people know how to solve this inequality is to keep on trying different x's until the hash value is less than the threshold. Okay? And because the hash function involves the previous block, therefore, when you solve the puzzle, your block is linked to the previous block. No one else can pretend that they have solved this because anyone who pretends has to really solve it. Okay? <coughs> And then you do this for every transaction, or you wait for a certain... Yeah, interest? so typically a block in Bitcoin is about one megabyte big. It contains around 1,000 to 2,000 transactions. Okay? Yes. Okay? All right. Yes. Oh, 
No, 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 no. Think about it. Think about the whole system has an infinite stream of transactions coming in. And then a miner just looks at the currently 1,000 transactions, the current one, and then put it in a block. When it succeeds in mining, it will now look at another 1,000 transactions, roughly, and put it in the next block and continue mining. The reason why these guys are spending so much energy mining is because every time they succeed in putting a block, they get some kind of block reward in terms of bitcoins. So that's why they're doing this. Otherwise, who would be spending all this energy doing this work, right? Okay? Yeah? Does it mean like, let's say I like make some transaction, I need a way for somebody to like, lead away my transaction to be in the next 1,000, so I want to try to like, hash, and then I need a way for somebody to successfully hash it for the transaction to like, go through. Yeah. And you have to wait longer, much longer, which I'll go to like, like, next. Yes, this is a minimum you have to wait, but you have to wait much longer terms out. And I'll explain why. Okay? Alright. So, there is a, um, so you say this is kind of simple, right? This is, a, this is a protocol. But implicit in this picture, actually, there's a decision. There's a decision. The decision is that the miner can mine anywhere. For example, they can say, oh, I decided to build a block on top of this block as opposed to the bottom block. But, no, but the protocol specifies that you don't do that. So the protocol is actually summarized in five words. Mine on the longest chain. Because in reality, there could be many different chains, but you always try to mine on the longest chain. Okay? All right. Now, what is the uh, number for the system? The number of system is that the average mining rate, <coughs> the average mining rate is about one block for 10 minutes. So I said that you have to solve this puzzle. The smaller the tau is, the harder this puzzle is, right? Because you have to satisfy this inequality. It's very, very harsh. So therefore, I can actually control the difficulty of this puzzle, the <coughs> protocol designer, by controlling the value of tau. And Nakamoto said that you should pick the value of tau such that on the average, you only solve the puzzle once every 10 minutes. Okay, this is probably a difficult one. Okay, so just remember these two numbers. Okay, now comes the central, I think the central, very central idea of Nakamoto's protocol is, <coughs> which is really the question you asked earlier, when can I confirm that a transaction is in the ledger? Okay, let's, let's check this out. So suppose now I'm growing this, this blockchain and now I see that my transaction is in the lock, is in the blockchain. Okay, so a natural so, uh, thing is okay. I confirm. I confirm that I received the coin, received the Bitcoin, and now I give you the car. Okay, so you bought the car from me. You say hey, I'm, I'm I'm giving you one Bitcoin, but I have to check. Did, did you really give me the Bitcoin? Okay, finally your transaction get processed by some miner in China for example, got stuck into the block. I see it, okay, now I can see it on my blockchain, it's circulating around. I confirm immediately. Is this a good strategy? And this will take roughly 10 minutes, right? Yeah, that'll take roughly 10 minutes, yes, okay. So can I get by with the latency of about 10 minutes, right? The answer is no. So in a, in a system like this, there's this notion of an attack. When you design a system like this, you're always worried. Okay, is someone going to try to attack my system? This is a system which carries billions and billions of dollars, right? If someone attacks it, it's really a, a disaster for the system. So you have to think of all kinds of ways that people can attack it, and hopefully your system can defend against such attack. But here's an attack that this, this current protocol cannot defend. 
So here is what an attacker would do. Okay? The attacker decides to mine, mine one block, oh, solve the puzzle. Now what the protocol tells the mine to do is that they should now release this block to the rest of the world. Right? So what this attacker does is two things. One is instead of mining on this block, which is what it's supposed to do, it mines on the previous block, which is not what it's supposed to do, but it can do. Also, it is not releasing this block immediately. It is wait until it gets two blocks. Okay? Two blocks. And then releases it. Let's see what happens. If this happens. Now, which one? So now you can see why the longest chain protocol has a meaning. Because now there are actually two chains this one and this one. And this one is the longer one. So, what would the rest of the miners do? They would build on this longest chain. Okay? And now, this chain has taken over because nobody is mining on top of this chain anymore. And so, this block is effectively erased from history. Okay? Guys, we are witnessing history revision. You know, a lot of governments, they try to revise history, right? But this is, you're, you're visualizing this. This is a bad idea, right? To be able to allow history to be revised is a very bad idea. Okay. In fact, you, if you think about, you know, the whole history of uh, society is about the winners re rewriting history. So this is bad. Why is this bad? Because I thought that my transaction, I thought that I received the one dollar Bitcoin, one Bitcoin, and I gave away my car to you. But after a while, I checked back, hey, my one dollar Bitcoin is no longer in the ledger because it's no longer in the longest chain. So nobody would recognize that I actually have this Bitcoin. So I've been cheated. Because the guy who paid me that one Bitcoin is actually the attacker. He spent that one Bitcoin to someone else. So this is what Nakamoto say, double spend attack. You have one Bitcoin and you're spending it twice. So then, if this happens, trust will be destroyed in the system. And this system will last. Okay, so Nakamoto immediately recognizes this problem. And he said that there's a way to solve this problem. And his suggestion is that, he suggests is that when you have, when you see a particular transaction, do not confirm immediately until you see that there are K blocks built on top of that block. When I say on top, I should say below. <laughs> but what I meant is like there are more blocks. So his claim, his claim, is that this will make it much harder for the attacker to rewrite history and remove this transaction. Let's see why. So, what the adversary will try to do is now grow a bunch of blocks in private, right? <coughs> What's the hope? The hope is that these blocks will be more than K, so that when it releases it, this whole thing will be replaced. Okay? All right. Now let's look at the situation, and this is getting to the heart of Nakamoto's paper here. Okay. So let's see whether or not the attacker can do this. Right? So let's consider two cases. In the one case, the attacker has actually more compute power than the honest node. So in other words, they have, they have bought a lot of machines because they think that this system is so valuable that I want to attack it. And I've got a lot of valuable machines. And my compute power is higher than the compute power of the honest node supporting this chain. What does that mean? That means that I could now, on the average, 
generate more blocks per unit time faster than this longest chain. So eventually, no matter how large k is, eventually I will get more blocks and I will not release it, the system will get that. That means that this system cannot protect against an adversary which has more compute power than the honest nodes. The honest nodes are the ones maintaining the system, following the protocol. Okay? The question though is, if the adversary power <coughs> is less than 50%, can this system work? So Nakamoto did a calculation. What he calculated was, as a function of k, as a function of the adversary power, what is the probability that the adversary can get more than k blocks? Now this is always possible. You remember that solving this puzzle was a random event. So no matter how weak the adversary is, there's always a chance that the adversary get really lucky and generate a bunch of blocks in succession more than the honest one. So Nakamoto went and calculated this probability. This is an example. If the adversary has only 30% of the compute power, the honest one has 70%. As a function of k, Nakamoto compute the probability of the attacker being successful. <coughs> okay? All right? And as you can see, that probability becomes smaller and smaller as you make k larger and larger. Okay? All right. Why? What is the basis for this table? <laughs> He's looking at the right thing. He's looking at the right two things. <coughs> this is not large number, right? Because this guy is flipping a coin with 70% bias. This guy is flipping a coin with 30% bias. So on the average, this guy will get 70%. And this is 30%. So this guy will be longer than this one. But when K is small, you don't know. You can get lucky. But when K is large, then low margin will, will take over. And the chance this guy win will be very, very small. Okay? So this is law of margin. Okay? All right. So, that, there's a drawback though. To get high security, that is small epsilon, you have to wait K large. For example, if you want to get epsilon to be, say, 10 to the minus 3, which is around here, okay, you have to wait about 250 minutes, 25 blocks, 250 minutes. 250 minutes is 6 hours, no, no, 4 hours. So you wait 4 hours before you can confirm something. That's a very slow system. Right. Okay, all right. So when we came, when we examined this problem, we see that there are kind of two drawbacks. There's a big drawback here, which is that you can wait a long time, okay? But there's another drawback, which I'll describe later on, which is that the throughput is also very long. Let's understand why. Okay, so remember that we have the transactions going in is one block every 10 minutes, okay? So that means 1,000 transactions every 10 minutes. So it's roughly seven and a few transactions per second. So that's why it's very slow, okay? All right, so at this point, at this point, we try to, what, is, what are we trying to do? We're trying to maintain this good security property, but we're trying to speed up the confirmation. And we're trying to increase the throughput, okay? So now we're gonna figure out how to do that. But before we do that, we'll take a few more minutes in digesting what we've learned so far. So Nakamoto protocol looks very simple, deceitfully simple, but actually the block is performing multiple rows. So let's dissect the rows, and that will help us to build a better <coughs> protocol, which will get rid of the problems of Nakamoto and then we'll be rich and famous.
but it's famous. Or not rich. Oh no, we should be like Nakamoto. Don't, don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> All right, not rich, not famous. Okay, so two rows of a block. So in the first row, transactions are being proposed onto the blockchain. Okay? And the mining rate is low, implies that the throughput is low. <coughs> okay? A second row is voting. When a transaction shows up, what is happening here is that the attacker is trying to present an entire history where this transaction doesn't exist. The attacker is trying to accumulate a lot of private blocks so they can replace the longest chain. So what is happening here is basically both the honest players and the adversary player is racing. They are all trying to wait for more votes. So these guys are voting for the anti-history, the bad history, and these guys are voting for the correct history. But you know, there's nothing, there's no, nothing called correct history. But this is the history that you know the honest people agreed upon, hopefully. Okay. And so they're waiting for getting more votes, and then the honest know you have more compute power, they will eventually win out. But you have to wait until a lot of votes come in before you're sure that this guy will not get more votes, okay? So therefore, the voting rate is determining how fast you can confirm this transaction. Because you have to wait for lots of votes. And the fact that the mining rate is low implies the voting rate is low, and that implies high latency, okay? So we have two rows, and we can see that the mining rate being low, one block every 10 minutes, is making the throughput very low, and it's also making the latency very bad. Okay, so there's a natural way of solving this problem. It doesn't take a genius, okay? And the natural way of solving this problem is simply to increase the mining rate. So why don't I just make this puzzle easier? Well, then everything speed up, right? Because blocks are generated faster, confirm faster, throughput faster, everything faster. It turns out it doesn't work. It turns out that as you increase the mining rate, as you increase the mining rate, the security actually goes down from 50% to 0%. Okay? Right, this is important to understand why. Because it turns out that when you increase the money rate, your blockchain becomes a block nest. <laughs> so why is that? Why does the blockchain become a block mess? Well, let's let's go back to actually, let's go back to that picture. This is ten points, so let's take a out a little bit. Okay. So you remember this picture, right? So people are mining on the longest chain. Now just imagine what happens if the puzzle becomes easier. If the puzzle becomes easier, what will happen is that around the same time, many people can solve the puzzle. Because it's so easy that it's very quickly solve the puzzle. And because there is a communication delay between them, remember there's a delay, they haven't heard each other. So now multiple blocks will be attached to the same block. And this notion called forking happens. And thus, the forking will create that mess. Now, why is that a bad thing? Why does the security go down? Because if your forking happens, that means your work is now split by these forks. And that means the longest chain is no longer growing proportional to the amount of honest computation power you have. And so it's more vulnerable to the attacker. The attacker doesn't need 50% power to attack you anymore. It has 30% or 20% of power. And as the money rate increases, security goes down. 
Okay? So therefore, we can't really solve the throughput and latency problem by simply increasing my rate because of my, the security goes down. Our objective is to maintain the high security of Bitcoin while increasing the throughput and latency. Okay, so we didn't give up. Vivek didn't give up. I didn't give up. So we just keep on banging our head because we figured there should be a way. So research is very important to keep an optimistic mindset. There's always a way. All right. So it turns out that what we did was we take these two rows and we deconstruct them and then we scale them. And that turns out to be a solution. Okay. So how do we solve this problem? So we have this chain, <coughs> like a model chain, and we understand that there are two rows. One is proposing and one is voting. And these blocks are very busy. They're kind of doing both proposing and voting. You know, the thing is that never assign two jobs to a person. If you're running an organization, do not assign two jobs simultaneously to a person because they're getting confused. They lose efficiency. Divide out, give a job to one person, person A, give another, the other job to person B. Okay? So that's what we do. So we figure out a way, first of all, to generate two types of blocks. Okay? So this is a cryptographic uh, change to the protocol a little bit. But since I'm running a little bit out of time here, so I won't go through the cryptography anymore. But just take it from me, trust me, because I'm a respectable professor at Stanford, <laughs> that there's a way for me to generate two types of blocks, okay? Instead of one type of block, two types of blocks. The first type of block is very similar to the Nakamoto block. They're proposing transactions. <coughs> but the second type of block, job, is only to vote for the blocks on the left-hand side. They don't carry any transactions. Okay, so what they carry is a link to a block that they want to vote for. Okay, and this is a structure. So you now you say this is this crazy Stanford professor is making a simple <coughs> protocol more complicated because instead of you know one type of block and one chain, now you have some two types of blocks and a separate chain in these votes. But what's the point? Well, the point is, this now allows me to increase the voting rate without compromising the forking. <coughs> and the way we do that is, instead of having one such voting chain, now we can have, let's say, 1,000 of these voting chains. They're all going in parallel. And they're each following the chain, and every one of them can vote for those blocks on the right. Okay? And, uh, okay. So I will go back to this picture. This picture, yeah. Um, is, is it cumulative? Do you sum the number of blocks in each chain? So each one of, I sum the number of votes. So each chain has a certain length. Yes. So each, one vote. No. Each block can vote, but each each chain can only vote once on each level. I see. Okay. All right. So I will think I will go through this a little bit more, but tr sort of at a high level, trust me, that now I have a very high voting rate system, and I can get very low latency. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, this is rather mysterious. Don't understand. People are confused. Okay. So let's understand this. Let's go a little deeper. Okay. Yeah. Let's go a bit deeper here. Okay. First of all, what is the? How do I construct the ledger? <coughs> how do I construct the ledger? So, at each level, I'm going to pick one of these blocks. So imagine there could be multiple blocks. I'm going to pick the block with the largest number of votes. Okay? 
All right, for each level, choose the proposal block with the largest number of votes. And now I'm a sequence of so-called leader blocks. And that sequence is my ledger. Okay? All right. So, let's understand why, what's going on here. Okay, all right. So, so let's understand why this is allows me to have fast confirmation. Okay. All right. Remember Bitcoin. What happens here? To confirm a transaction, you have to win because this is K deep. K has to be 25 block deep uh, to get 0 0.001 probability, and that's a long time. And the reason is because you don't want a competing block to accumulate more votes than you and therefore this place is transaction, right? Let's look at the analogous situation here and why we can confirm faster. Okay, so here was the picture. We have 1,000 votes. We have 1,000 votes. Let's say 1,000 voting trains, chains. Now let's look at the analogous situation, okay? So the analogous situation is what? The adversary will want to remove these 1,000 votes and ship more than 500 of them to this block that it creates in private. <coughs> okay? Now, how does it ship 500 votes? It turns out that in our protocol, each of these chains is protecting the vote. So the only way for the adversary to change a vote is actually to fork off an attack on each individual chain to change the vote from here to here. Okay, so here's the slogan. If you don't remember anything, my talk is slogan. Before, the blocks was protecting directly the transaction. Now, the voting blocks are protecting the vote. That protects the transaction. So protect the vote. <laughs> That's important, right? Because, you know, if you want to run a great election system, you have to protect the vote. So these guys are protecting the votes. Okay? Now, the question is, do I need to wait until this is 24, 25 block deep in order to make sure all the votes are protected and therefore the adversary I know cannot change these 1,000 votes? Do I have to wait that long? Why? Um, because now you have multiple chains to the end of that. That's right, because now I have multiple chains to the end of that. And I claim that actually I only have to wait till we say two block deep. So let's see why. So if you go back to Nakamoto table, he will show you that if you only wait until you're two block deep, then your chance of reversal is 45%. That's very bad. <coughs> right? A very bad system. If you look at each individual chain, if you wait two block deep, then the adversary can, by luck, generate a longer chain and reverse it with very high probability. So if you have a single chain, you never wait so little. You have to wait longer. Okay? But now I claim because I have 1,000 such chains, although each one is very unreliable, it's still okay. So what does the adversary has to do? It has to reverse 1,000 of such votes out of 1,000, 501. Okay? So now, you tell me, what's the chance? Is it easy for the adversary to reverse 501 vote here? So out of 1,000 chains, what do you expect the number of votes that the adversary can reverse? 450. 
Law of Lodge Dunquist, right? 150. But I need to reverse 501. So all we need to do is to calculate what's the probability you can reverse 501 vote, given that on the average you can only get 150 votes reversed. And that probability is, happens to be 0 0.001. Okay? No. No. So, what happens is that to get each block on the average is 10 minutes. But to get 1,000 blocks on the average will only take 10 minutes also. So your block generation rate overall in our protocol has increased by 1,000 times. It's okay because I can always adjust the one rate by changing this difficulty. Okay? So the point is that each of these guys are growing very slowly so that to prevent the forking. But overall in the system, the blocks are generated very fast to get the high voting rate. So okay. as a miner, I decide to join a random voting chain, or and I do the... Yeah, so this is the question that everyone asks us, because it's very easy to get confused. But no. So the miner, actually what the miner does is the following. The miner does exactly as before, keep on solving this puzzle. But when they succeed in solving the puzzle, we have a way of saying, okay, you solve the puzzle, and we'll randomly color your block. So the block that you generate will be, will be generated randomly thrown into one of these 1,000 chains. Plus one, actually. This is also this one. 1,000 plus one. Okay? So remember, actually, actually, I can explain it. It's very simple. Because remember, when you solve the puzzle, it's less than tau. Then you can think of, when you solve the puzzle, is the result is interval from zero to tau. So what I do is I split this interval into 1,001 sub-intervals. And depending on where you end up, I will just color you into one of these chains. And this is something you cannot control. Okay? So very important, the adversary cannot choose what chain to work on. Because otherwise, then they'll focus all their power in attacking a subset of the chains, and the security system will be compromised. They can't do that. It's randomized without the knowledge of the attacker. Okay? So, so in some sense, our whole design is basically based on understanding and using the law of Washington Post. Okay, that's it. You know, it, this research really does not require you to take a bunch of courses in, I don't know, <laughs> measure theory or probability course or some advanced statistics course, all you needed to do is to take 178 advertising times. <laughs> EE 178, a very good course, taught by the esteemed colleagues here. Including and they'll you. teach low of large numbers. And that's it. That's all you need to know to, to do this research, basically. All right, a little bit, a little bit under evaluating, underestimating your ability here. <laughs> but the intuition, so the intuition here is that before I was using law of large number over time. But that takes too long. And now I'm doing averaging over sort of space parallel chains. So Professor Ada Poon talked about what? MIMO, right? MIMO is about sort of it's space about diversity. in parallel over space. This is like, you know, MIMO applied to blockchain or whatever. Okay? Okay, so that's basically fast confirmation. Now, to wrap it up, we actually have a way of improving. So if you look at the system, now I have a very high, very low latency system because of this. But the throughput is still very low because you have only a bunch of transactions every block. And so 
we follow the same architecture, and the goal here is we decouple the transactions and put it in a bunch of separate transaction blocks. So a third type of blocks, voting blocks, proposal blocks, and transaction blocks. And then we just have these guys have reference length to these blocks so that this is secure and this will carry the throughput very high. Okay? Good. So now I have a high throughput and low latency system. Yeah. Well, how can one block represent multiple transactions? The transactions take a place at different times. How can one block? So these are all typically quite different transactions. Mm -hmm. But they happen, you know, hours apart from one another. What, what do you mean by hours apart? I didn't quite understand. I guess this is maybe a great question. But, um, there are three different kinds of transactions. Yeah. No, there's no kinds of transactions. There's only one type of transaction. Yeah, okay. A pays B yeah. a certain dollar, a certain number of Bitcoin. One, one Bitcoin. But do they have to happen concurrently? If they happen concurrently, they will be, that's okay, they will put in different blocks. <coughs> but the thing is that they will be ordered. The important thing, so you see, what the consensus does is it really provides an ordering to the list of transactions. So it doesn't really give you a reality of what event happens before what events. Consensus is basically defining a sequence of events <coughs> such that everybody agrees on that sequence of events, every, all the honest people. It doesn't, so there's no notion of drawing truth in some sense. It only, its job is to agree on something and never change that order. Okay? All right. So, okay. So in a more advanced course, I will go into the theorems. So there are theorems which guarantee that this system has high throughput, low latency, and good security. Never mind about those. Although that's like 70 pages of our paper. Never mind. Don't worry about it. But now let's go to something a little bit more fun which is the visualization. So now let's go back to the first picture I have. Okay. All right. So that's it. That's our protocol running. Oh, you have to click it twice. I have to click it twice. Oh, yes. Yes, All right. Yeah, so these are voting chains. So the miners are generating the blocks. The blocks are, are randomly thrown into different voting chains. These voting chains are voting for these proposal blocks. <coughs> these transaction blocks are generated in separate pool. When a proposal block shows up, it will bring in a bunch of these transaction blocks. And this is like, this is a legend. So now we have a high throughput, low latency system. Okay, now, so in research, there are sort of two types of research. So right now, what you're seeing is a simulation. I was going to introduce Rebecca, who's going to show you the system running in, in, in the wild. Okay? So this is a visualization of the protocol. So just give you a feel of the protocol. <coughs> okay, so research are two types of research. There's theory research. And there's system building research. Okay. So we finished the theory research a while back. Okay. Write a, write a nice paper. Got accepted into a good conference. Happy. Okay. But we think, you know, but if you write a theory research, you just have a protocol and improve some theorems about it. The second part is can we really build a system that works according to the theory? That's the point, right? And that's what Rebecca will show you. But in this case, you don't just need to build the system yourselves, right? You have to convince all these people around the world to shift to your protocol and not use the old protocol, no? Or um, how would that work? Like, uh, so no, no. Okay. Because actually now there are many different, so Bitcoin was the first one, but now there are hundreds of different blockchains running in the wild. Oh, I see. So when they, uh, but I thought it, they use the same blockchain protocol, just the name of the no, currency. No, not all of them use the same. Some of them, yes. Some of them just took like a model protocol and just uh, do some marketing change. I see. But 
There are others which the protocol is quite different. Of course, none of them is as good as ours. So you also created a new cryptocurrency with your... No, 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 so what we did was we built a software. We have not built a crypto system. So we built a blockchain software. Okay. And um, this software is run by multiple clients. It's a real decentralized software. So, and actually, I think yeah. Vivek will show you more about what building the software means. Maybe just give some sense to the student, you know, what yeah. building a software means here in the context of blockchain. you saw how Prism was designed and how it works. So what we did after this is uh, we built the whole protocol. Uh, that is, we wrote the networking layer, the cryptography layer, the transaction layer, and you know, each, uh, so the way the software works is you have many nodes or many machines running this piece of code on different machines, and they're talking to each other. Right? This is how Bitcoin works, and this is how our software also works. So while I was sitting there, I just launched uh, 36 instances of, uh, sorry, 100 instances of uh, AWS machines. So AWS is like, uh, it's, it provides you uh, a way to launch machines on the cloud. So I launched 100 machines which I've never used before, okay? And uh, now that I've launched 100 machines, what I'm going to do is, uh, so let me tell you a little about these machines. These machines are just as powerful as my Mac, okay? So it's a server sitting somewhere in Oregon, Ohio, I don't know. And uh, now they're just waiting for me to start running commands. So the first thing what I do is, uh, I'm connecting these machines via a network, right? Because as David explained, like all of these machines have to talk to each other. Each time you mine a block, you have to send it to other machines. So what I've done now is uh, I've connected these machines by a four degree network. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount a solid state disk on each of these machines because as you start mining blocks and as you receive blocks, you need to store them on a disk. So is it done? Yeah, it'll take like maybe a few seconds. <coughs> so these solid state uh, disks help you to run uh, these protocols at much higher speed compared to, say, a hard disk. I hope this gets hmm. Any questions, like? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. See, this is the thing, if it's live, right, so you never know how much time it's going to take. Sometimes it takes 10 seconds, sometimes it takes 10 classes. <laughs> So 100 is like a big enough number to show that like the networking stack works and the system is scalable. Like Bitcoin runs on like roughly uh, 10,000 or 20,000 clients, so we thought 100 was a good estimate. Why not use Stanford servers? Why not use Stanford servers? Uh, I mean, it's just easy to... <laughs> <laughs> so this is a pretty standard. AWS is a pretty standard yeah. cloud computing for people to do research on. But at this moment, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Should I use that, for example? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just. Yeah, mounting sometimes has problems. Yeah. And they kind of unmount at this moment. Yeah, let me just try mounting. Oh, and there's another reason why we don't have a thousand or 10,000 servers is because the cost grow proportional to the number of servers. And we're in a limited budget here. We just <laughs> didn't get too much to it. Okay, let us try to just use. Okay, let me just, let us 
Okay, hey, maybe. Let's uh, <laughs> let's use the hard disk. Let's not use a solid state disk. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, install the software in each of these machines. I hope that completes. Let me just try this. Let us first. Uh, I'm just reconnecting these machines. So adding a network layer, mounting. Saki asked uh, David it was so when David showed uh, the visualization, it was a simulation. But now that we are running the demo, this is uh, a real visualization of the system, and this is the blockchain from uh, one single node's perspective. All right. So what's happening is hundred nodes have started running the system. They're talking to each other using a four-degree network, and uh, we've optimized the system to get maximum throughput, that is, you want to confirm as many transactions as possible in minimum <coughs> number of time. So, uh, if you remember, David showed uh, these three performance metrics of Bitcoin, that is security, transaction throughput, and confirmation latency. And now, uh, let me show you the same three properties which Prism achieves, uh, which is somewhere here. Yeah. So this is the network with 100 nodes. And uh, you can see that roughly every machine is connected to four or five other machines. And uh, three panels, security, throughput, and latency. So first panel is actually the throughput of the system. Uh, you can see that the gauge here uh, is the current throughput of the system and simultaneous throughput. It's roughly 200,000 transactions per second, all right, because we are using a uh, network uh, with capacity of 200 to 250 megabits per second, and we are filling the whole pipe. So this is roughly 200,000 transactions per second. And here is the instantaneous throughput of the system. Because the system is stochastic in nature, so it won't have like a constant throughput because of the random events. And you can see that the instantaneous throughput of the system uh, is a little different for different nodes because they have delays between each other. And the second panel is the latency of the system. Uh, and here the confirmation latency <coughs> is roughly 20 seconds because we are mining one block every 10 seconds. And like, you saw that two block deep was enough to confirm a transaction. And you see roughly that 20 seconds is enough to confirm a transaction. Uh, and the third panel is, uh, is a proxy for the security. Uh, so. Bitcoin has 50% security because the blocks are mined <coughs> at a very low rate, and hence there are very few orphan blocks, right? And we saw that as you increase the mining rate, if you just blindly increase the mining rate, your, it, the system will have a lot of forking, uh, and that decreases the security. So instead of directly showing the security, I'm showing you what's the forking rate in the system, and you can see it's quite low. And that directly translates to 50% uh, security. And in the last five minutes, uh, the system yeah, has in this working rate is equivalent more or less to 50 percent. Yes. Yeah. So your security is approximately 50 percent minus the working rate, which is almost zero. So the lower your working rate, the closer your security is to 50 percent. Uh, yeah. Why, why do you guys diverge from not low distributors? Uh, so Nakamoto, like when he released his stuff, it was 2008, where the networks were not as good as today's network. So that's the reason 
uh, it was designed for 10 minutes as well. But if you see like blockchains like Ethereum and other blockchains which are quite popular, mm -hmm. they have a 12 second uh, like interblock time. And that's still slow enough to prevent it. Yeah, that's still slow. You can see that, right? It's quite slow. Quite low. The porting rate is quite low. Uh, yeah, in the last five or 10 minutes, this whole system has confirmed roughly yeah, 27 million transactions. Okay, any questions here? So it's, it's just this slide converted to a software and this has been nine months. What kind of things are running on this blockchain? So currently, uh, good question. So we are running uh, a Bitcoin, the Bitcoin script that is, uh, you just have payments. So you just, like you have 100 nodes, right? That just randomly pay each other. Using each block to be like around 64 kilobytes. Okay. So each transaction is roughly half a kilobyte. So. So if we scale this up, so let's say that everyone in the world starts using your blockchain, is there enough information? Is there enough places to store that data on various different devices? Oh, so that's a good question. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So because we are, uh, like, because you're mining too many blocks per second, like roughly corresponds to 200 megabits per second. So then you're right, each of this machine has to store a very long history. But uh, turns out that like, not everyone has to maintain this long history. Like you can have different kinds of nodes. Some nodes only maintain the last two days or last three days of history. And that should be good enough for practical, in, in a practical system. But you're right. Thank you. So it's an inefficient use of space. That's right. So there is a different direction of research which tries to have uh, different nodes store different blocks. Yes, this is another lot of research. Yes, that's right. Nakamoto didn't really care because the blocks are very slow. But if you get to a system with high throughput, then to alleviate the storage problem, then the natural way is to try to do some division labor across these nodes. But this is beyond the scope of this lecture. We actually, we have some, actually the system that uh, he's showing you already has this property, but we didn't talk about it yet. The system he showed you is actually beyond what I talked about today. So the research keeps on going. Don't stop. What are some other applications you want to show you? Or what do you think will be the biggest um, Yeah, so um, one, so for us, you know, high throughput, what type of applications would be a so called uh, running a decentralized exchange where you have to, for example, stock exchange, right? It is not a cryptocurrency. But you have to keep track of these stocks, right? Who pays what, who buys what stocks. And so you can imagine a decentralized system, which instead of having a centralized New York Stock Exchange, can keep track of that. So that is, those are the applications that a lot of people are thinking about. It's called DeFi application, decentralized finance application. Another set of applications is um, IoT. I don't know if you, is there any speaker on IoT uh, this time? No. IoT stands for Internet of Things. Okay, so the internet of things means that you have many sensors collecting data 
And based on this data, maybe you do some control, like self-driving cars, etc. And now, instead of having a centralized authority keeping track of all this data, if you can have a blockchain to keep track of this data, so that you can have value to this data. So for example, nowadays, our va the value of our data is kind of kept track by Google or Facebook, right? And then they monetize it. You have a blockchain where we can sort of decentralize the keeping track of data that you can imagine perhaps we can give reward to the data generator. That's you and me. Because now the blockchain sort of keeps track of who owns what. Yeah. You mentioned the double spend data attack. Yes. Are there any other like similar kind of Yes, yes, that's right. So, in fact, to prove a security theorem, you have to show that your system is secure against all attacks, not only double spin attack. Okay. So, for example, there's an attack where you do not do double spin, but you keep on balancing two chains, growing at the same rate, mm -hmm. and you sort of switch back and forth between these two chains. So, the, there's always confusion. It's called a balancing attack. And so we deal with that as well in our analysis. We show that's not possible. How do you predict all the attacks? Yeah, that's a mathematical model. So you have a, so what is an attack? An attack is an adversary strategy. I don't know if you, if you study game theory, for example. So in game theory, you talk about sort of a set of strategy. So here's the same thing. You have a set of adversary strategy in your model, mathematical model, and you prove that your protocol will work well no matter what the adversary does in this class of strategy. So it takes math which is beyond E178 to solve these problems. Yeah. Just to give you some credit. Just to give you some credit. <coughs> okay. Maybe we'll take the rest of the point. Some of you have to go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, Gates, I think we just pulled out.